Good. Well, thank you very much for joining me on stage here. I have a, a Steve, a Scott, and Rory. Would you, Corey, would you like to sort of just go through who and what you are and where you're from, just to sort of give me an introduction there? Sure thing. I'm Steve Feldman. I uh, am a group media director at uh, Universal McCann in New York. I head up the MasterCard business there. Um, prior to that, I was uh, at the M office in San Francisco working on various Microsoft pieces of business. So. Good, thank you. Um, Scott Ross at Nielsen, and I've been there about 10 years and worked through just about all our products on the online side for audience measurement. Great, thank you. Uh, my name is Corey Jeffrey. I'm a member of the Client Solutions Partnership Group at Millward Brown. A uh, prior colleague of Scott's at Nielsen, uh, I've been sort of focusing on the marketing accountability space broadly with an emphasis on digital, digital return on investment uh, for the better part of my career. And um, our mandate within client solutions uh, at Millward Brown is to just drive meaningful impact for our clients and helping them understand the value of their, their marketing investments uh, against their objectives, both short and long term. Okay, so I'm going to throw some quick fire questions at the moment. You can only answer yes or no. I'm going to deliberately do that. So, Scott, if we're going to make TV advertising more interactive, are we going to see more or less people, sorry, more people skipping ads, yes or no? They're more likely to skip ads? Yes. Uh, sorry, are we going to see them less people skipping ads if they become more interactive? No, they'll still skip them if they can. Okay, all right. Uh, Corey, are mass audiences really going to sit and make social comments on adverts in a TV world? Yes or no? Uh, if the adverts are any good, I think uh, I think we're yes or no. Y yes, yeah, <laughs> we're seeing it already. Steve, will a percentage of interactive TV advertising become substantial? Yes or no. Interactive TV advertising. No, not in the short term. Okay. Scott, golden question: Will there be a, a metric common to TV and online? Yes, yes. or no. Feel, feel confident about that one? I do. Okay. Corey, are people going to start buying TV ads at a scale through a DSP network? Uh, I, I mean, I, I, I think the jury is out. Uh, yes or no? Yeah. Five going to be you, you got to you. You give me a time frame on that, on that <laughs> question. I would say yes within a three to five year horizon, and depending on the, the type of inventory we're talking about. And Steve, one last question. Will there be such a thing as a TV buyer versus an online buyer in five years' time? No. Yes or no? No. no, there shouldn't be today, as a matter of fact. Okay, all right, so thank you for that. I deliberately want to cut you in because I want to just sort of wind you up a little bit and sort of move into the other questions. So we were talking about redefining engagement in terms of what I was sort of just talking about there in terms of the value of exposure um, without an action, which is really what television is all about. So if TV is kind of, so we measure about online in terms of people are touching and lean forward and engage and interact, and television is actually more measured measure the opposite way in terms of the tuner ways, in terms of those people who, who aren't watching the content. How do, you sort of, how do you sort of see that we're going to move as we move into this interactive television advertising? What is going to happen there in terms of the value of the metrics for engagement? How are we going to start looking at the, the engagement metrics there? That's a good question. And, and, you know, we need to go beyond the base engagement that we have now. I think you pointed it out, you know, just now. Clicking on an ad, interacting with an ad, these, these are metrics that need to, frankly, go away. And, and what we do need to get is to kind of deeper econometric type analysis that is able to factor in, you know, high funnel brand type metrics, things, you know, purchase intent, awareness, perception, things like that, and able to model them out in terms of determining success rather than a simple click through. And, and we're starting to do some of these things uh, at UM, you know, agency page. But, um, you know, it, it's something that I think is, is going to be more prevalent. So what is going to be sort of more of a common metric than sort of in terms of video everywhere? What are going to be those sort of measurements that we need to be looking at? It's, it's you know, partnering with folks like, you know, Inside Express, Dynamic Logic, these sorts of folks, getting, you know, high funnel brand KPI reads, and then, you know, determining the relative success and efficiency of online video as it, you know, relates not only within online, but also to offline metrics. Like, you know, we'd love to compare online video to TV, for example, or to radio or to you know, out of home or something like that. And, and we're actually at a place where we're, we're starting to get there and determine the relative efficiency in driving brand metrics on an advertiser by advertiser level. Can you measure online and TV in the same way, though, in terms of those, those metrics? How are you looking at that? Sure, you can. I mean, uh, you know, for me, it always comes back to uh, defining your objectives. You know, measure what matters for what you're trying to achieve. Uh, there may be some, you know, um, higher order metric from an audience measurement standpoint, you know, obviously 
uh, some of the efforts within, within Nielsen's domain, within the audience measurement domain generally to provide consistent, unduplicated reach and frequency measurement across platforms. Uh, I think that's gonna be a linchpin, but I think you also need to then be selective about what deeper fire engagement metrics matter for what you're trying to accomplish with your media, with your advertising. Um, and, and there's no panacea there, and there are a wealth of available data, uh, and so it's really a matter of, of choosing wisely and then really holding you and your stakeholders accountable against those, those KPIs. Scott, I mean, we tend to think about television as more of a branding medium, and online has almost been reduced to a direct response, probably because of those things like the clicks and everything else we've been looking at. But in terms of as we start moving over, and, and I mean, I think everyone's pointed at you unfairly about what Nielsen has been doing, right. when we know a lot more about the automatic content recognition that's now been put into TV advertising, so that we can actually get accurate measurement from Nielsen as we move forward. How do you see that sort of changing the industry in terms of how Nielsen has been perceived to date as just sort of a, a, a panel-based uh, system? Right, so yeah, I, mean, I think you're talking about the commercial ratings in terms of what we're measuring. Um, well, where we're going increasingly, especially driven through online, is the cross-platform rating. Um, so try, and as we get those two together, I see everything just converging in terms of how you're measuring exposure to ads. And as there's more video being viewed through other devices. You're just going to see campaigns that don't make a distinction, say this is an online video campaign, this is a TV campaign. As the campaigns blur the lines, so will the measurement. So do you think, um, I mean obviously there's a, there's a halo around television that we've been able to pick up through the various channels that I was sort of talking about earlier on, this sort of the way that it's moving over in terms of social media and everything else. So how do you sort of see that moving forward in terms of being able to justify television or measure television, video content over TV and online, as you talk about these cross, these cross metrics? Well, I think there's, there's two variables there. The first would be just ad effectiveness. So over time, I think each advertiser agencies are gonna understand what's the impact between the devices and price accordingly. And the second might just be the prestige factor. So there could just be in terms of a preference toward larger screen for specific campaigns. Okay. I'll go further and just elaborate that I think scale, uh, you know, and, and it's been a theme through every presentation so far this morning. Uh, scale is really the key axis for evaluating advertising effectiveness. So there's sort of, you know, there are all the touch points and interactions that somebody can have with a brand um, uh, at an individual level, right? And we represent a different profile for our media usage, our media consumption patterns than, you know, your average American. So we bring a lot of that industry bias, I think, in, in with us uh, to these type of, of discussions. But the fact of the matter is not everybody is um, uh, as actively engaged in all of these media consumption behaviors as, as we all tend to think, or it might not happen on the same timeline that, that we all tend to anticipate. I mean, I think the growth in, in video on demand is, is really uh, illustrative of that. I mean, that's, that's technology that's been around for you know, a long time now, and I think it's really just in the past few years achieved critical mass and started that explosive growth uh, up the, um, you know, sort of up the hockey stick. And so, you know, when we're talking about effectiveness, uh, you have to think about, you know, the difference between affecting someone uh, at an individual level through any, you know, sort of combination permutation of all the channels at, at that person's disposal, and then the effect for the brand at a higher level of aggregation. Are enough people engaged in that type of, uh, of that behavior for it to really bear on you know, the in-market sales of a you know, multi-billion dollar brand, uh, we're talking FMCG or auto or financial services. So that's sort of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about measuring what matters. So I mean, we'll, go, we'll go back to this sort of like the television, sort of the branding situation. I mean, obviously TV's going through a massive thing at the moment of going from SD to HD. And the whole thing has been talked about as sort of lack of tuner ways. And it's very much at the high level in terms of those things. I mean, talk to me a little bit about this, um, you know, this, this, the television being still the prime driver of awareness and the high funnel compared to sort of, I don't know, Yumi we heard from earlier on versus an NBC, for instance. What's the situation there at the sort of the top level? Yeah, and, and right now NBC is getting credit, frankly, for a lot of these kind of high funnel awareness type metrics. And, you know, we've done a lot of research at UM, and, and we know that. Yes, that's true, but you know the the Yumi's of the world and and Hulu and, and these types of folks, they're they're also driving great high funnel brand metrics. And 
Um, and something that's interesting is, is that even though perhaps Hulu's a $20 CPM and NBC's a, a $10 CPM, when you factor in some of the research, uh, it turns out that Hulu could, could be even more efficient for you in terms of driving brand metrics once you, you kind of go back and regress those, those numbers. It's, it's just all about the measurement. And, and in terms of a, an eGRP, you know, that's, I think that's you know, a bit of a fallacy because it's, it's something where you know, it's the online folks trying to make a, a grab at TV dollars. And, and, you know, they've got, you know, and not they, we, we have so much going for us in terms of not only, you know, measurability, scalability, uh, availability, you know, and, and, you know, we need to tie it to brand metrics, and that's what's really important. You brought up a great point, which is how can we drive sales or, you know, awareness or whatever that is. And, and you know, because a GRP is only representative of a, a fraction of folks you're reaching. It's a reach number. And, you know, why box ourselves into an eGRP? When, you know, yes, that may be a measure of how we buy and sell. But ultimately, I'm not trying to reach 1% of adults 25, 54 and making 150K plus. I'm trying to reach our target consumers and, and drive them to direct engagement and actions. And, yeah, and I mean, even on online, we've seen this whole shift towards CPA and, and this whole move away from just this, you know, started with the cost per click because that's all we could do is click on ads. And we've moved increasingly into those engagement points at a further level down the, down the channel. Do we see television going down the same way? Do we see things like social media, search being the way of evaluating how effective a TV is, rather than just the sort of the fluffy branding situation, but actually going into some of those, some of those deeper search points. I, I think we, we can use a lot of these things, and uh, you know, it's something that you've got a lot of folks out there like Crimson Hex, Gone Radiant 6, uh, People Browser, you know, things like that that almost can be white labeled in terms of determining what are the most popular TV shows, what are people talking about. Uh, we could use search to see what are they searching about, and, and that can really give you an engagement type of metric to understand what are the TV shows that are the, the most engaged. You know, we know that you know, Dancing with the Stars might have the highest rating uh, season to date, but, you know, we know that that's the eighth, you know, I'm, I'm a bad example, eighth most talked about TV show in social media, and we know that Jersey Shore could be number one, for example. So, you know, it's something that I think smart advertisers and smart, you know, folks will kind of, you know, almost have a secret sauce of we know what works for us, and we can kind of hold the cards in that and, and, and target those properties for purchase rather than just going after a rating. But do you think in that case that you'll use that as an agency against where you're buying the media from in terms of having a deeper level of the value of actually what's being on offer? Uh, we already have. So. Okay. <laughs> um, talk to me about the perceivable value. I mean, you talk about the cross-channel metrics. Is there a difference in video? If it's the same television show or video content, whether it's appeared on an iPad or a, a television set or a mobile phone, we just said saying actually in the peripheral vision, it's actually the same. But is there actually a noticeable difference from any metrics that we've, we've perceived from, from measurability of, of the ad effectiveness? From a, from a, a branding, you know, from a brand, from a branding standpoint, uh, I think what we've observed now sort of time and time again is that uh, you'll achieve a greater delta uh, between somebody exposed to some new format and somebody not exposed to that format uh, in the earlier stages of deployment of that format. There's a novelty factor. We saw, that with, uh, we saw that with online, we saw it with online display, we saw it with online video, we're seeing it with mobile. Eventually that starts to, to wane. Um, and so uh, I think, you know, again, you, you need to be less concerned about, you know, maximizing the impact to a small audience by virtue of using novel platforms and be more cognizant of, you know, how do these things work together to, you know, ensure my brand health, drive my brand equity, and translate all of that down to lower funnel behaviors like purchase when they're in, in somebody's in the market to make a, to make a purchase. Uh, and so, you know, the metrics exist, both sort of upper funnel, if you will, from a, a brand effectiveness standpoint, all the way down through, uh, you know, short-term incremental sales effectiveness from an ROI standpoint uh, on both counts. And so, again, I think it's just a matter of, of ensuring you've got a dashboard composed of the right metrics for your brand's objectives at a given point in time. So we started to see, you know, in terms of television changing to the three-second bumper slots to get around this television skipping. And yet, interestingly, we're seeing the other situation where people are interacting with content and choosing to spend, as we heard, nine to 24 minutes with content. And increasingly online, we're seeing actually some of the actual longer form content, uh, compared to what we thought of in the early days, is actually more effective than actually the shorter form advertising content. How do you see, see that moving forward in terms of how advertising content needs to be adapted across devices? In terms of there, is it going to go shorter? Is it going to go longer? Okay. Um, I think over time, as content moves toward 
basically being platform agnostic, you're going to have to you're going to see kind of an equilibrium in the the content to ad mix. That if over time you're going to have less ads in your online mix versus TV, you're just going to skew behavior that way. And that the only way over time that you're going to be able to maximize you know your investment in content with ads is going to be to keep it basically platform agnostic, and people just will will you know the behavior will basically distribute based on convenience and you know, preference. Sorry. Uh, sort of my, my snarky comment at the beginning about you know, making good ads, it, it, it bears on this, I think, to some degree in terms of you know, make advertising that carries content like value and people will watch 13 minutes worth of it if they get something out of it. You know? So I think you, you, know, you defer to consumer choice based on how they want to experience the brand and whether that's you know, a 15 sec second spot or a 15-minute you know, bumper sort of um, deeper dive experience. Give them those options and then deliver content or an advertising experience that people are going to find value in. So you're talking about creativity, obviously, versus reach. There are fundamental different kind of questions in terms of what the connotations are. But I mean, we talk about addressable advertising and seeing what's happened with Canoe Ventures and in reference this morning. So addressable advertising, is that the holy grail or the black hole for, for television and in terms of, of where we're going on that one? I think you brought it up before. It, it's dynamic, you know, and, and addressability. I was actually having this uh, conversation this morning with, uh, with Miss Tanya, this world. But, um, you know, it's, it's something where it, it's really expensive to, to go and buy zip code right now or something along those lines and, and target. It's just, frankly, more efficient to you know, to buy a $2 CPM from Comcast and, and blast it rather than targeting certain zip codes. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's something where eventually, you pointed out before, no matter the device, we'll be able to dynamically, you know, insert ads, whether it's TV, you know, mobile, video, et cetera. So, um, you know, it's, it, it will evolve and it has to. You know. But this is the interesting thing about the online, the whole idea of targetability, and we've ended up with DSPs, and really it's about buying cheaper reach. I mean, really, at the bottom line, in terms of what we're actually seeing with the DSP. So if you're taking that viewpoint and television is bought as a reach, blast out mass media, then really where does the addressable television come in, if that's, if that's where it is? Is it going to be in terms of the media buying, or is it going to be in terms of the dynamic creative that needs to be overlaid onto a standard media it's buy? both. You know, you, eventually, it'll be through a, you know, we'll call it Cadron, because that's what you know, we deal with you. <laughs> but you know, they'll be able to get you exactly the audience you're looking for you know, no matter, you know, regardless of the device or the program, ultimately, as an advertiser, you want your target audience, and you eventually, um, you'll get to a place where you'll be able to reach those folks, you know, regardless of where they happen to be. Now, you know, NBC is not going to release The Office to, to that sort of, you know, ad exchange, if you will, and, and ABC won't release Modern Family, but I think that you have a lot of kind of inventory that will be available. Microsoft is doing some things, Canoe was, you know, Google, It'll, it'll grow eventually, and, and there, I think eventually there will be able to, once the walls are broken down, you know, to, to be able to target audiences. I just add one thing there, that I think when we talk about targetability, we kind of gravitate toward the ad networks, DSPs, because you know, I think it's been part of the online discussion. But I think from a publisher standpoint, if you can maximize your revenues, if, you know, let's say Stephen comes and says that, well, I'll pay higher CPM for every impression you give me or every... Uh, person viewed in my target versus out. The incentive for a, for a network will be I'm gonna, to invest in targetability to maximize the revenue they're going to be able to get. Um, I think the challenge is the cost involved in getting to that targetability. You know, how do you balance that versus the increased revenue? So in that case, you know, does a TV model stand to exist moving forward now that we've got people like Apple, Microsoft, Google, Intel suddenly jumping onto this whole thing and, and the wave of technology that we're going to start seeing in terms of all those things. What's that going to do in your perception in terms of, of from, a, from both a creative and a, and a media buying standpoint? From a buying standpoint, ultimately, I think we'll be as successful as the inventory is available. So, you know, you've got entrenched models right now in terms of, you know, NBC not wanting to share their rate card. And, you know, certain advertisers might have a very low base. Coca-Cola might have been on MTV for 30 years. You know, they don't want to give up their, their $5 CPM and put it up to a bid model when they're now bidding against every new advertiser, you know, and my mother. So, you know, it, it's something where, 
you're gonna, it's gonna have to be profitable. And right now, I don't think the networks see profit in, in changing it right away. It'll be kind of a slow burn to it. We're running out of time. Corey, what are you, what are, what's your thoughts on that? I, I really tend to agree. I think it's just gonna evolve sort of collaboratively and it's gonna be driven largely by, again, I, keep, I feel like I'm saying the same thing, but it's gonna be driven by you know, each marketer and each campaign's uh, objectives, right? So you know, targeting is wonderful unless you end up sort of talking to a very d tightly defined target uh, at a very high frequency and possibly sort of running the risk of, of existing in an echo chamber. Um, amongst that, that segment, right, where, you know, if you're Colgate, your target is everybody that has teeth, you know, so I, I think there's always gonna be a place for just relatively broad-based reach, you know, reach buys, um, and then, you know, again, being able to leverage context and platform to give consumers the opportunity to go deep or deeper with a brand, uh, and that's where, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna find that incremental value that justifies the higher cost for, for target inventory. Now, one question we haven't got to, and I'm gonna start throwing back out to the audience. We've got some questions here for, for you guys. It's this shift towards a single currency, the CGRP. So right now in China, they are buying IGRP. It's got IGRP over there. They're just looking at its reach and frequency. Forget all, the, it, there's more holes in it than the Swiss cheese in terms of the actual deep dive measurements. But they've just decided that we can go out and buy reach more cost effectively, and we'll figure out from a technology perspective how we deliver it. And we're starting to see that now come back into the states as certain agencies equally are looking to buy it, although we haven't figured out the details. So what are your views on a single currency on an EGRP? And I'm gonna let you have some sort of time to discuss that amongst yourself on your tables, if you would, and then we'll sort of come back with some sort of comments back to the panel and then we'll try and throw it, throw it around ourselves. So but. here's a question for the panel. First of all, engagement is a concept, not a currency. So if we're trying to figure out currencies, engagement doesn't have any homogenous agreement as to what it is or how one might quantify it. Gentlemen, how would you quantify engagement if we were to have a unified EGRP? Discuss. <laughs> You're gonna, all right, I've got this. See, that's the no, answer no, no, I get no. back from every single guy. <laughs> Nielsen, you don't get off the hook. I had lunch with John Burbank. I said I was gonna torture you right now. E oh. Engagement is a concept, not a currency. Make it a currency. So this is actually, this is something that we're tackling right now at UM and, and, and probably other agencies as well. And, and what you, you need to do is on an advertiser by advertiser level, look at the metrics in market for your respective brand campaign, et cetera, and determine the relative efficiency of this media type, i.e. online video, and moving your brand metrics can, and compare that to TV, radio, out of home print, so on and so forth. And, and ultimately, you know, it would be great if you can get the, the TV network or the online video you know, content provider to sell you this brand metric, say, okay, we're MasterCard, we want uh, brand perception, and I wanna buy based on brand perception, you, you need to move me up 2% based on this buy of $500,000. And you know, I don't know if they're gonna do that, but you know, again, it's something where we can hold the cards in determining what's more effective, you know, in terms of whether it's certain um, sites, certain TV networks, whatever that is, and, and we can, you know, we know what works for us, and we'll, and we'll still buy on 18 to 49 CPM if you're Hulu, if you're willing to sell out to us, but we know that, you know, these, these four shows or these, these certain blocks of, of, of comedy or, or whatever works best for us, and we'll just go out and, and target those to death, you know, because we can exploit those, you know, relative efficiencies. I don't think, you can, I don't think this, is, this whole idea of engagement meaning touch, we've got five senses, you know, the most powerful one is your sight. I mean, you'll drive a two-ton truck down the road and change direction based on a sign that says Reno this way, Vegas that way, or something like that. And, and so we don't need to physically touch everything to make massive life-changing decisions. And that really is the heart of how advertising works. And for me, the biggest bane is the online industry is we've made this word engagement and equal touch. I think you can't, and in the television perspective, we actually go back to the truth of it in the fact of motion graphics, sound sight and motion, the way that it actually connects with me and changes my Dean, Dean, nobody yeah. disagrees. I'm asking the following question, and I want the group to get to it too, but let's get the question exactly framed the right way. In the second, I'm gonna make this up, but it's gonna prove my point. In the second to last episode of XYZ TV show, Dancing with the Stars or American Idol, where there was voting, there were 70 million votes. In the last episode where there was voting, there was 80 million votes. I'm not an idiot. 80 million is better than 70 million. It's, they were more engaged, there were more people engaged. I get that. I am now the sales guy in one of those environments, and I've got to charge more for that engagement. How much more do I charge? Engagement is a concept, not a currency. 
How do I get there? Well, uh, so first I'll say, uh, from the Miller-Brown dynamic logic perspective, that vision sounds awesome. Right? I mean, the extent to which engagement is held to a can you drive uh, brand, you know, sort of traditionally defined brand metrics. Love it. Um, I think uh, w my perception, anyway, of, of where the world is headed is is more along those lines of what what can you capture and quantify from a behavioral or emotional uh, interaction standpoint that can be a proxy for what I would call like viral rate of diffusion, right? So what is the multiplier that you get in terms of earned media on the back of your paid media investment? I agree, how do you get, what's the eGRP? How, what's the quantifier? How do we as an industry move this concept of engagement into something that we can quantify and charge for? How? It's fine, I think as long as the landscape of how people uh, are able to interact with, with those assets continues to evolve, it's a moving target. Anybody here do that? Does anybody here quantify engagement and charge for it? Oh, so tell me how you're trying to. Tell, say your name and tell us how you're trying to. <laughs> Good luck, we're all counting. So uh, I'm Neil Shapiro from Shazam, and by trying to, I mean we haven't gotten there yet, but that's one of the biggest things that we're trying to do with Shazam for TV is turn your 30 second spot into a five minute engagement on your smartphone and then how do we quantify that? How do we measure that? How do we uh, you know, drive what you need for your brand? Uh, we are absolutely not there yet. Um, hopefully we will be you know, in the next three to six months. I mean, we've been doing it for a year. We have a lot of learnings. But, um, but engagement is really what our currency is. You know, taking that 30 second spot, grabbing that experience off the screen, and then you know, hopefully engaging with your brand. Time spent. Time spent not necessarily with Shazam, but with the brand experience. I'm Brad Piggott. I'm the Vice President of Sales for Brightroll. And since we've got video, one of the main KPIs of video is completion rates, right? So, any, and everybody does this, all our competitors, but it's, you know, it's the, for an engagement perspective. It's pricing on what the engagement is. So I would go to Steve, I'd say, Steve, what does MasterCard want to do? Do they want to get a registration? Do they want something like that? It's not necessarily a cost per action, but more it's an engagement. Is somebody downloading the slate of an interactive video? Are they doing something like that? So it's multi there's multiple plate ways we can price it. It's just really trying to define what the engagement is, asking the right question. Is it f a filling out a form? downloading a menu, what have you. But it's definitely doable, and there's ways to price it, you know, to, have, to be able to price it. A, a statement, actually. I'm sorry. I'm Kim Tom with Jiwire, and uh, the way we're measuring it is with our mobile app product, which is called Compass, and that's a, a kind of a, an ad that acts like an app. So when the user uh, interacts with it, which is usually to drive them to retail, it's a geolocated app, and when they click on it, it opens. They see locations that are within their proximity. They click on directions. They click on walking versus driving. They watch a video. They can uh, see a promotional offer, and then all of that is tracked, so we're able to tell the advertiser how much time was spent, who clicked on walking, driving, who clicked to call, how much time they spent with the video, and overall. Awesome. Is there someone here in the room from an FMCG or, uh, or any uh, QSR, any retailer, anybody who's got, is there a package goods person in the room who's selling package goods, fast moving consumer goods or CPG? See, I, the app thing is interesting. Apple actually, I was at Apple a couple of months ago with uh, a bunch of people and actually I took a group from, from iMedia uh, earlier in September. And the nice people at Apple were trying to sell iAds and that's kind of a funny concept. And the lady on the, uh, said that she, uh, and I won't mention her name, but she did a very nice PowerPoint presentation where she said that people are engaged with eye devices with their apps for 45 minutes a day. And I asked her how that's possible with battery life being what it is, because my iPhone only lasts 45 <laughs> minutes, but she swore to me that that was true and that I was an idiot. Um, then I asked an FMCG company who was with us, I said, okay, I've got a question. And this is the question that no one in the room can answer because you guys are not represented here. But I'm gonna ask this question and I'm gonna ask the panel to deal with it. Here's a story. My FMCG fast moving consumer goods clients that were with me took me on the side and said, Shelly, here's the problem. I cannot correlate 
engagement with an app for 45 minutes a day with market share. And that's the only way I get governed. I need to move velocity of my product at retail. If I don't increase velocity at retail, I don't make any money. I don't get a bonus. Can you somehow correlate engagement with an app for 45 minutes a day on iAds or any other app with velocity at retail and market share so that I can throw money at this because I can't make a case for it? Discuss. I'd say you could absolutely do that. Um, and, and in fact, we are at UM. So. Uh, in, how you do it is what you need to do is, is turn the 45 minutes of engagement on site X into a metric uh, that is a proxy for your brand's business result. Now, we'll call it for the CPG awareness because that's what they care about. Top of mind awareness equals product sales at the shelf. So you measure awareness, and then what you need to do is translate that awareness, and then you need to measure the business outcome and how that ties to awareness. And, econo and from an econometric analysis standpoint, regress that and be able to determine that this is complicated, but we, we are doing it. And, and no, I like this. Everybody's yeah. going to get a lesson in linear regression. Exactly. So what you need to do is, 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 is essentially marry up the two, the proxy for the business result and the business outcome in and of itself, turn it from measurement into business proxy into business outcome, and then create that, that. So that's exactly how most thinking people would do it. And if you don't understand that, ask him later or ask me, and I'll tell you about linear fun with linear regression and calculus, because it's really fun. Derivatives are awesome. But here's a question. It's exactly how you do it. Why doesn't everybody do it that way? It's, it requires a large investment, frankly, um, from a, a measurement you know, and capturing it standpoint. It's easy to partner with you know, <laughs> Dynamic Logic to, to do a $40,000 know, test result on, on your campaign with Hulu, but it's hard for an advertiser to capture these on an ongoing basis, whether it be weekly, monthly, et cetera, and then invest in the, in the kind of agency's tools and turn those top line measurement results into, into kind of business outcomes. We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars upwards of, into the millions. And, and frankly, not, not a lot of advertisers do that. Ad budget is three million bucks are willing to make that investment to learn it. Now, you know, when we did business with Microsoft, obviously they had some money to invest in this sort of thing, but it's, it's, it's something where I think it will evolve and it'll take that investment from hundreds of thousands of dollars into something that's more kind of amenable towards advertisers that don't have those sorts of budgets. But surely the complexity of what you've just talked about is why the entire online industry has gravitated towards a single point of metric, and we've called it a click, and then how many people transfer through and measure something on there, and Shazam, all we're doing is just creating another click through. You know, and, and to turn around and say all the problems we've had over here and saying that click doesn't give us the full package and the full understanding of engagement, we're not going to solve by clicking on TV ads. Because all we do is replicating an online problem and not solving it. And so that's not actually going to be a, an answer for engagement in EGRP because it actually reduces the value of the exposure that you don't touch. And there's a lot of stuff that we don't touch or never will touch, but there is a, still a value associated with that. That really is, is surely the point of engagement. This is a conversation that could and should go on for days. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. Let's give the panel a big hand.